Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Jonathan Tuttle. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Give us a quick rundown on your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, just kind of started off in a real estate family. So my dad was a developer for custom homes, built a lot of custom homes, uh, general contracting. He also had three real estate brokerage offices at one time. Um, so just kind of always grew up in the real estate realm and just kind of developed my passion for it, starting off early and then eventually got into it uh, professionally a little bit later after, uh, you know, when I felt like I wanted to get into it. <laughs> what drew you to real estate? I feel like a lot of children of parents who are in any career, not even just real estate, but anything, they sometimes they want to go into the same thing their parents do. Sometimes they want nothing to do with whatever their parents are doing. So what what caused you to actually kind of get drawn towards real estate? Yeah, good question. So yeah, that's kind of what happened. I grew up with that. Then I did uh, retail sales in my 20s. They really well with that. And then later on, I'm like, okay, now I want to get into real estate. Uh, I, th- I think just the financial freedom and the ability to you know, create your own destiny and create your own wealth. And you know, it's in your hands, not other people's. And that's what I really think drew me into it. You have a digital marketing agency mm-hmm. and also your real estate business. Which one came first? Were you making so much profit from your digital marketing agency and needed a place to park that money? You got it into real estate or did it kind of come about differently? Uh, well, first real estate, because I got into real estate in uh, 2010, but um, digital marketing, I started really getting a passion for about the same time. So it just kind of feeds off each other. So one of the things for, which we'll get into later, but my fund and then my info course, both of those are you know marketing online. So my agency basically does all the digital marketing um, I got into digital marketing really, really, really into it, like 2012, 13. That was before even Facebook ads were even relevant back then. So, I mean, they just came out. I got, I got really into like the digital marketing side, really deep dive into the agency model, uh, 2017, 18 is when I really you know, deep dive into it. So, but yeah, it feels each other's business. So basically the digital marketing is everything's online now, even this, what we're doing is online. So just having that you know, having those resources and that, you know, that knowledge, it also fuels everything else. And it's, I really like both because, you know, everything we're in such a digital age, everything's digital. So it just kind of provides for both. And in the real estate side, obviously that's always going to be there. So. In the real estate world, why did you choose the mobile home park niche? Yeah, it's because uh, during the last downturn, we're like, we got our first park and I it was literally when every other real estate, like had really, you know, everything in 2008, nine was like just down and crashing our mobile home parks doubled, tripled in value. So we just, they're the one we had, you know, we kept raising rents and we had people begging to come in. So when I saw that, I was like, all right, there's a supply and demand that needs to be solved. And we have, because there's only about 44,000, 43,000 change parks officially. So when you have the only affordable housing option, uh, it just made sense that, you know, this real estate is, has something unique, you know, unique attributes to it. And I used to tell my friends, they'd be like, mobile home parks like what is this now it's becoming more mainstream it's on a lot of podcasts and stuff like that but at that time like when you tell people mobile home parks they just looked at you weird <laughs> but uh it just yeah it just i just saw the returns from like, like i alluded to with my dad i saw him do all different types of real estate and this was the one that was the strongest performing during the worst times and like that was just the light bulb moment the majority of real estate has done very well during this pandemic and i think this pandemic is a bit different than what we experienced during the recession of 07, 08, 09. But how have mobile home parks performed during what we've now experienced during this pandemic? Yeah, they were the, according to Green Street, great question. They were the top performing real estate last year. Uh, the Green Street data is like the aggregate of all commercial real estate. I mean, some of them got crushed. Obviously, like walls got crushed, hotels got crushed, anything that had, you know, had something to do with the pandemic and being shut down. Well, we were the only one that really thrived. Uh, I think it was 12% increase in value last year. And the next closest was like nine or 10 and it was industrial. So obviously everyone's doing e-commerce stores and online like Shopify stores. So that obviously feels that, but um, it just did extremely well. And then uh, there was another data, I forgot who put it out, but they were saying like some parks even had uh, appreciation of like 20%. It was like in a Wall Street Journal article. So it just did really well. What happened was, there was uh, Wells Fargo that uh, they uh, finance 
you know, pretty much every asset class and they're the biggest financier of mobile home parks. And they had, they were seeing collection rates like 94, 95%, even during the pandemic. So we didn't have issues with like, you know, people not paying like some of the other asset classes that, you know, the rent moratoriums, we didn't really have issues with that because where else can you live for a couple hundred bucks a month? And people realize, realize that. And most of the people that own are mom and pop owners. So they have like a relationship with the, the tenants so all that kind of factored into just making it just a really resilient during uh, the kind of the chaos that happened last year. Are you finding that a lot of tenants are compressing the classes of properties that they're renting? So if you're in an A class, you might come down to B. If you're in B class, you might come down to C, C to D and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of people falling into your mobile home parks that might not have otherwise lived there. And that's potentially why they're doing so well during these times of economic uncertainty, whether it's this pandemic or it was the last one or maybe any before that? Yeah, we've we've had, had tenants before that have, I mean, people that make 70, 80 grand a year, you wouldn't think of, but they just live in mobile homes because it's it's so much cheaper and they have a you know such low overhead and bills, it gives them the ability to like travel. Uh, and that's one reason like it just people want to have affordable housing. Even if they make 15 bucks an hour, the average income in America is around 33,000. So that's about the average tenant in the mobile home park. And in regards to investor wise, investors are becoming into our niche because they're chasing yields. Like you're seeing cap rates across the country and like multifamily, like fives, you know, like for a BC class. And so for, we're seeing that like people coming in from other asset class chasing yields because we were like always like two or three basis, two or 300 basis points higher than other asset classes. And now some, you know, certain coastal stops, we're seeing mobile home parks trading the threes and fours now too. So it's like, (laughs) it all kind of, it's, you know, you know, as more, as more institutional money comes in our space, we're going to see more cap rate compression, but we were always historically known as like the, uh, you know, the asset class that was just crazy cash and cash returns and crazy, the best tax benefits, because you could depreciate the land at 65 to 70% of it on 15 year improvements. Uh, when you acquire a park. So like, you know, multifamily has a 27.5. We have 27.5 if you own the homes in the park, but so we have the best tax benefits of all real estate. So even if we don't have like the crazy, you know, you know, a couple of years ago, 10 cap was norm. Now it's you know, lucky to get a six and a half, seven, uh, but you still have all the tax benefits. So we're seeing people come in from other asset class. And then for tenants wise, we're seeing people that just want affordable housing and or half the tenants are seniors. And so baby boomers, there's a thing called the silver tsunami, which is going to be happening. You can Google this articles, but a uh, majority of uh, mom and pops, you know, that's the senior citizens are going to be selling off their homes. It's supposed to be like a huge influx of single family homes. And they're going to, you know, basically flood the market with new homes. And they're going to be going to class C apartments and mobile home parks, which is only going to feel the demand even more. And people are living longer now too. So it's only going to feel the demand for the next foreseeable future. For those listening who may not have heard of investing in mobile home parks or even what a mobile home park is, give us an overview of what they are and what the strategy is. Yeah. So it is like, it is like kind of getting more commonplace than it was a few years ago. We've gotten a lot of media in the last few years, but it's basically like an apartment building, but you don't own the units preferably. So you're basically owning land that has like apartment units on it. It's probably the best analogy, but they're actually little mobile homes. <laughs> and uh, the strategy behind it is, one, you have a, like you've a lot less overhead comparatively or expenses like trip, uh, traditional apartment building or 55, 60% expenses when the AC breaks or the roofing, you replace all that. But in a mobile home park where you mostly own just the land and the, don't, don't actually own the homes, the tenant replaces that. So it's less, you don't have to have all those extra bills. Uh, additionally, it's mostly, it's mostly just land improvements. So like your biggest, you know, cost and, impro- you know, keep the park you know, the cap X, Y is, is going to be uh, your sewer and water lines below it. That's what you want to see. I've seen some people post online like, oh, you don't have to, you know, due diligence, like drive, you know, buy your park on scene. I've seen people <laughs> post this on like Instagram. I'm like, this is the only asset class you do not want to do that because literally the biggest nightmare could be like, yeah, the park looks great on Google, Zoom or, you know, but if you don't know what's your biggest expense is the water lines, if they're broken or cracked below you and you have a four hundred thousand dollar you know replacement bill and you just didn't buy it sudden scene and didn't do the proper due diligence. So the biggest you know overhead for the industry, what we have we look for is just the water sewage lines below the park. You get a little water, you get the little uh road rotor guys with the cameras that go through there and they look at the pipes, uh the trees, and then that's like and then just your grounds. And so since you have such a less overhead 
it just gives it a lot higher cap rate, you know, and that's what's really been driving force behind it. So what the, the basic strategy is, you're basically just being a land owner and renting out spaces on it. And so when you have a lot less headaches, a lot less, you know, bills, it makes them, just makes more sense than most real estate classes. What is the difference between investing in the mobile homes themselves? I know some people do that versus investing in mobile home parks. Well, mobile homes is the, and here's, there's, and I have a, a course on this too, but the, uh, the strategy behind mobile homes is like, you could, it's like arbitrage. I think it's the best way to look at it because people don't look at it correctly. Like it's the same thing. My analogy would be like a Shopify store where you, you buy something and drop ship it and you mark it up, you market it better. It's the same premise. Like there's not like, there's no really like the MLS, the brokers don't like to take on the listings because the most cities and most areas are not worth that much. They're not going to sit there and do showings for, you know, $15,000 a mobile home and they could be selling a $300,000 house and making way more money. So brokers really don't put it in there. And if they do list it, they don't know how to price it. So, and there's not like any aggregate data. So nobody's really keeping track of what the home should go for. So it's kind of like an arbitrage uh, way of doing business. And so you're basically finding homes that you could spruce them up or they just need to be marketed better. Remember 50% of them are senior citizens. Well, then if you know how to use Facebook and marketplace and you know how to put some better ads up online, you're going to get a lot more demand. You can charge more. So it's kind of like arbitrage. Um, and there's very little repairs you have to really do typically. I mean, it depends on the age of the home. If it's pre hod which is 1976, uh, but anything after that, they have higher standards. Uh, most of the time it's, I'm like, you know, single family flipping. There's so many, you know, you need 700 credit score, uh, so you have to put so much money down. This is a way for anybody to get started which for a couple grand. And so that's what I like about it is for people, if they understand the arbitrage and also being able to do some minor repairs and how to market online, that's your, that's how you make a profit. So it's a lot less capital, you know, to get a small park and spend a million dollars plus, but to get a small mobile home, first mobile home, you spend a couple grand. So it's kind of where they're at with financially, or if they have, don't have investors, the easiest way to get started would be flipping mobile homes. Are mobile home parks themselves accessible by new investors or do people have to wait until they have a bit more experience and capital and relationships with investors? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, there is some challenge and nuance behind it because it is different. Uh, it's right now because there is a finite amount of inventory and there's a lot of new investors coming in the space. So it is hard to get deal flow if you're just somebody like literally just starting out and say, Hey, I'm on my first park. Most brokers aren't going to return your call because they have a hundred people that, you know, will close on it instantly and have the financing and they know the due diligence, but you come in like, Hey, I want to buy my first park. They're probably not going to show it to you unless it's like something that's way overpriced that everybody has turned down or just like a park that has a lot of, you know, a lot of hair, a lot of, you know, hidden problems. So the biggest thing, like I said, going back to the due diligence, you want to do the correct due diligence is the most important thing about acquiring a park. So you want to make sure like the zoning's, you know, the, the, it could still be operating as a park when you transfer it over because sometimes some cities, municipalities in certain markets don't like it because A, it's the lowest taxation for them and they could usually get more for any other real estate asset class in terms of taxes. B, like the average tenant for the mobile homes are paying 10, 20, 30 bucks a month at that in uh, real estate taxes <laughs> when they could have a house there, they're collecting five grand. So the city doesn't want it because they're losing so much revenue and they get the same school fire. It costs them money. Um, and so for going back to your question, yeah. So it's, there's some nuances and things you got to learn. Uh, probably better to like get some information before you get, you know, your first park, get some, you know, some knowledge behind it because if you get the wrong asset class, you don't do the property diligence, you could have a, you know, a big problem on your hands. We've alluded to this already in the conversation, but there's a difference between a mobile home park having park-owned homes and tenant-owned homes. Talk to us about this difference and what your goal is in your parks. Yeah, well, the the ideal model, which most people kind of follow, is basically where you're the you just own the land and the tenant owns the homes. And even for like Fannie Freddie financing, which they're now because of the duty to serve act, the government has to allocate 37% to affordable housing, and it's usually mobile home parks and land. Uh, or farmland. So it's like, we get like a huge influx of like new, new financing from the government. And their stipulation is that you have to have a certain, like less than 25 park owned homes. So they don't even want, and they also want to have a, a contingency plan to how to get those off your, off your hands, basically. What are you going to do to market it? Obviously just do Facebook marketplace, have a website. That's all you really need to do. Uh, but so you dip, you don't want to have all this extra, ideally you don't want to have all those extra homes because then it's just more 
it's more management, more labor. You can make it part of your business, you know, cycle when you transfer new owners uh, and mark them up like five or 10 grand every time you flip them and put in some new paint, you know, power wash the outside. So there is a, uh, you know, there is an income stream from that, but it just, you don't, the value to the most mobile home park owners is kind of like what the opposite of what apartments is. So you're not like sitting here maintaining all that stuff. You're just basically maintaining the land. And so that's the, the, the true value between most, you know, where the park doesn't own the homes and that's what you typically want. What is rent to own financing? And how can someone use that to eliminate maintenance and repair costs, motivate tenants to take better care of the property and allow people to get started without a lot of money? Yeah, it provides a, a, a solution to people uh, that need it. So we just recently did one. We were trying to solve for cash, but the tenants that went to buy it and we just did a, you know, basically rent to own. You basically use it as a way to help the people that need it most. And you can have like, say the lot rents 350 and then you add like another 350 towards the payment for like two or three years, depending on how expensive the home is. And even if they make 15 bucks an hour, it's still one fourth of their income. So and just an avenue for people to, you know, they're going to appreciate it because it's something they probably haven't owned before too. It's something they could own and keep wherever they, you know, and sell it themselves. So they typically, most people really appreciate it. And three, worst case scenario, if you have any issues with the tenants, like, typically do is you just say, Hey, like I'll give you a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks to get out. And then you just put it back in the market and you mark it up, you know, and make that profit again. So you don't really have those issues compared to like, you know, people aren't going to trash it typically <laughs> like an apartment a unit and somebody goes out and they smash the walls. Usually like, all right, we'll give you a thousand dollars. If you want to move in with your friend or whatever. And then we just put it back in the market, mark, you know, mark up five, 10 grand. And then we put it, you know, put it back in the market again. So there's, it just really solves that, uh, uh, you know, just that affordable housing. That's really what it does. How are you choosing the markets you're interested in purchasing in? What specific data points or metrics are you looking for? And then tactically, how are you actually finding cities that meet those criteria? Sure. Yeah. It's getting harder and harder because a lot of people are coming into the space now. We focus on the Midwest because the cap rates are uh, you know, significantly higher than most of the yeah, outs, you know especially the coastal cities we're seeing like i alluded to before threes and fours and even like i've heard arizona's getting some like you know prices that low too as well uh but in the midwest we're seeing cap rates still six and seven seven and a half maybe eight depending on the uh, asset so we focus on that just because of that just just the returns make sense and the demands there um in terms of like trying to you know find deals it's it's a lot of relationship driven industry so the longer you've been into it and the more you know people know you the deals will kind of come to you if you have those relationships. So then you still got to be boots to the ground talking to people. But yeah, that's like, we just look for 75 to 250 units, uh, less, you know, mostly uh, tenant on homes and just make sure the infrastructure and the due diligence, like doing the due diligence process is good. So there's a pretty, it's a pretty turnkey industry once you're, you know, been in it for a while. It's not, there isn't too much curveballs besides the due diligence component. As part of your fund for raising money for your mobile home park deals, you've limited your investor pool to not only accredited investors, but specifically accredited investors who are able to invest a minimum of $450,000. First, where did you come up with that amount? And second, why have you chosen this as your strategy for raising capital? Yeah, you get two different types of clientele. Like with the, the really big people that write the checks are a couple million or five, 10 million, like the family offices and the foundations. They typically don't want to be in funds or partners with people that put in a lot less. So like the big check writers and the people with institutional money, you could either go for that or you could go for just the everyday. The everyday person is still kind of stuck on multifamily and there's still a learning curve. The institutional guys get it. So I just kind of, you know, going forward, we're, we're focusing on the bigger amount because we get a serious, more serious person. We get a more sophisticated investor typically. The, the guys and you know that can write a couple million dollar checks what we've seen is like it's they 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 get it and then the people the people we get from just coming in from online a lot of times are like oh I've heard about them but then like I want to get in space in like three or four years so they're not action takers from what we've seen it's, we have a five year run there's only five or seven years between everything gets goes from eighty percent mom and pop to like 10 20 percent mom and pop like you know basically kind of self storage is um, so it's it just basically getting a better clientele and the people that, you know, once you, when you, you know, have the 450, 
it doesn't, the money doesn't matter to them. Like people that have a lot of money, they don't, <laughs> it's crazy. They'll be like, Oh, you want a half million? You want a million? So, and then, you know, the, for accredited wise, it's, you get to market it online. I saw what happened with, uh, you know, Grant Cardone got sued by one of his investors and it, accredited it's just you just deal with somebody that doesn't the reason why the you know the sec has a credit is for people to you know that they, they they feel could you know if something bad happens or if they don't they, they have more money than a typical person so the sec wants people that can have more money to you know if, if it goes bad it's, it's not going to be a big deal but somebody's not accredited and if the you know the deal went bad then it'd be it's a lot more of an impact to their lives so it's just a lot more with the SEC. Basically, they have so many laws, and when you're marketing online, it's you know, it's it's a basic gray area, and it's a chance for you get sued, and it's also a chance for you'd have like issues and and I just things I don't want to deal with. Basically, <laughs> what are the downsides to limiting the people that you're raising capital from? Does it make it more difficult because you're giving yourself a smaller pool of investors to work with? Yes and no. So it's, I mean, if you look at, and I talked to other funds, most of their, it, it now you're seeing that too, like Grant usually does like 250 to 450. Uh, a lot of the other funds that I've seen, like once they already have established pool of uh, investors, they, they usually go to like four to 500,000. It just comes down to what we, the feedback we got from uh, a lot of these like institutional uh, check writers. So they want, you know, they, what they morally, what they really want is a bigger fund size. So our next fund's probably gonna be fifty million. There's a lot of uh, you know institutional money that will only write checks if the fund's fifty million ab- above. It's just a requirement, and so it's just a lot less work if you only have to have like you know forty investors or thirty investors instead of like four hundred. <laughs> In the next part of the show, we're gonna get into a segment that's called the action plan. Which habit or principle do you follow in your life that has had a big impact on your success that you don't think enough people do, but should? Yeah, I think uh, one habit, I think, which is having, well, the most basic stuff is probably the most effective, like just really uh, having goals for the day, what are you going to do? Wake up with a purpose, uh, you know, make sure you're hitting your goals. I always have like when I wake up to, I always have a, like a podcast or audio book. So I'm feeling my, basically getting my day start, you know, started correctly, do a little bit of workout too, just so I, you know, keep healthy because I'm usually on a computer for like 14 hours a day. So just all the basic stuff actually makes the most biggest impact because every, if you come down to like the, the basic principles, it all comes down to that. And for me, as those few key things always make the you know, biggest difference because if I didn't have a you know plan, if I just kind of, you know, woke up whenever I didn't have, you know, I didn't feel, you know, feel my brain with what I needed to get my, you know, basically motivated for the day. It's just a lot harder. So I try to keep it simple things basically. What has been the most influential book in your life? That's a tough question. I, uh, <laughs> well, I recommend Scribe. It's an app. It's like eight bucks a month. Uh, they'll throttle you after, cause I do a lot of audio, like I said, audio books and I would, I would usually get like six or eight a uh, month. <laughs> So, but it's a book. It's like literally, I'm paying a buck for a book. So, I, when I'm working on the treadmill, I have it, you know, in the background. But that's such a tough question. I have like a twenty or thirty of like my favorites. I would say for the real estate audience or uh, audience, probably the Sam Zell. Am I being too subtle? Because he gives like a lot of his like mentality and his and what he was thinking when he was when he was buying this property or selling this property. And if he's, it's an incredible story. I don't know if people are familiar with Sam Zell. He's uh, the second richest person in Illinois. He's also the biggest owner of mobile home parks. Uh, he's also the biggest owner of apartment buildings and also the biggest owner of office buildings. So, but the one thing that kind of key takeaway too, you want to follow smart people. He's sold off half his apartment buildings in the last couple of years and half his office. And he's still the biggest owner, but last I knew, but he's kept all of his mobile home parks and he's adding more. So it kind of shows you you're following billionaires and what they're doing. They're always kind of seeing how the trends. So, but that book really kind of outlines how his philosophy is and what he looks for when he's trying to, you know, take down a deal, basically. When this episode is over, before the listener quickly jumps to the next podcast or audio book that they have queued up, what is one action they should take that can help improve their life, career, or business? One action they can take to improve their, uh, I would say probably, like, it kind of goes back to the goal setting. I think if you don't have, and if you really, I mean, goal setting with a purpose, I think people, a lot of people don't take action. You're like, 
I, you know, I hire different people in different companies and like, even if they're good at their job, sometimes people get lazy or they just don't take action. And I think just taking action, even if you fail, you know, learn something, but just keep taking action. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to test. That's being an entrepreneur. That's one of the main things you want to do is you want to just go out there and test, 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 because it might work for someone else, might not work for you, but you're going to learn some things. You're going to pivot and we strategize and you're going to grow from that. So just be relentless and take action. As simple as that sounds, most people don't. So if you do that, you're one step ahead of them. Before we give a handoff to where people can find you, I like to wrap up the show by turning the tables and letting the guest ask me a question. So what question do you have for me? Sure. Cause I'm about to start my own podcast. So like, what are, what are a few steps you recommend when you're first starting out the podcast? I think the hardest thing is being consistent. So I think that's the first thing I would mention is just be consistent and make sure that you're committing to it for a year, two years, if not more. There's so mm-hmm. many podcasts out there that only have, that don't make it past three, four, five episodes, let alone 10 or 12. So I really, for anybody that's getting started, understand you can't just do a couple episode and episodes and it take off. You really are going to have to commit to this. And whatever your frequency is, it could be daily, it could be weekly, it could be bi-weekly, whatever that is, just commit to that for the long term and make sure that you're really going to do it for at least a year or two before you really even start to evaluate. And then you can go from there and decide, okay, is this something I want to continue to do? But it takes a, it takes a while. Yeah, it's kind of like YouTube where I see people start a YouTube channel. They think it's going to take off right away. It's got to put out content, content until it starts picking up, moving traction, get some you know eyeballs on it. It's the same, same premise, same principle. Yeah, any any content creation is like that, whether it's YouTube, podcast, yeah. social media, it doesn't matter what it is. You have to do it consistently for a long time before you're going to gain any traction. Yep, yep, exactly. Jonathan, for anybody that's interested in learning more about mobile home parks, anything else that you have going on, where's the best place to connect with you? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons I came out with the Mobile Home Wealth Academy because accredited investors, like when you ask that question, it's only about 12% of the population. So, you know, while I'm out here and people are wanting to find out more about it, I created a course where it's like step-by-step teaching how to flip, wholesale, uh, invest in mobile homes. And the cool thing about it is, unlike all the other courses, I have uh, like six hours on how to get your first park. And like, and I even have the contracts to either do like, you know, park financed and or purchase contracts. So plus I have a list of every park, all the due diligence on both sides. And so it's just a really great avenue. So somebody wants to get started in the easiest real estate and one of the hottest you know, niches right now. And that's the Mobile Home Wealth Academy. And then the fund is called Midwest Park Capital. And like you alluded to, it is a, it is a higher you know, initial 450. We also will do single deals too. So we're looking at some single asset deals that fall outside our fund criteria, but they come to us because we're online and you know, just being in the industry for so long, we have some deals that wouldn't fit our criteria for the fund, but we could take those deals down. So if people are interested in that, and we can, those could be a different structure than the, uh, the fund structure. And that's Midwest Park Capital. I'll be sure to put a link to those different resources and other ways people can connect with you in the show notes for anybody that's interested in checking it out. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.